Good morning, or depending when you're watching this, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. My name is Ross, and I was always told I had a voice for radio, so today I am bringing you round two of the Norwich League Challenge from Athena Games, and we've got a doozy for you. Remember, this is the very first day that Sun and Moon is legal for tournament play. Literally, the Friday it became legal. On the left, we have got Scott Simmons, a very experienced, very good UK player, regular fixture at Worlds now, got top four at the European Challenge Cup, all of that good stuff. Scott, he's becoming well known as a very good player and he is playing Persimian, one of the most hyped new decks from this new format. Check out uh, my video about Persimian in the description if you want to learn more about this. Now on the right we have a chap called James. I'm not too familiar with James but I am shall we say well informed confidently informed that he is a lovely chap and a fairly new player been playing about three months time but a regular at athena games and by all reports becoming quite a skillful player now we did see a mulligan from scott there he had no basic in his opening hand but we can see a persimian coming down there so only one of the mulligans there so is it going to be james or scott starting off it looks like it might be scott Yes, it is. So Scott draws his card there, and it is a Shaman. Very nice top deck. And straight away, the turn one town map from Scott. I said in my video, town map is absolutely vital for Persimian. As you can see from the picture on the screen, his attack does more damage, depending on how many Persimians are on the bench. You don't want any prized at all. Good news for Scott. There aren't any. Does have two nest ball prized, if you're wondering what those balls are. So Scott does there play a trainer's mail. He gets to look at the top four cards of his deck. Put any trainer card into his hand. He finds a sycamore. Now, Scott here, he wants to set up. What he really needs here is free Persimian on his bench. He doesn't need an energy this turn because he's got next turn to get the energy. He's going first. He can't attack. But he needs to draw cards. He needs to get set up. That Skyfield... I mean, look, Rayquaza's going to be playing Skyfield, and Persimian's going to be playing Skyfield. So essentially, the first one to put down Skyfield gets to use it, and every other Skyfield in the game will be a, a card that you draw that you just can't use. So getting your Skyfield down first is good here, because it means that you've got three useless cards in your deck rather than four. Now, he does get a Bursting Balloon on the Persimian. That's going to be key if James gets an attack next turn. He'll have to take six damage counters from that Bursting Balloon. And we did see that Scott actually discarded a single Puzzle of Time. You want to play two of them. If you play two Puzzle of Time at the same time, you get to grab any two cards from your discard pile and put them into your hand. Very good for a deck like Persimian where you're recovering Persimians and double colorless. Bit of a shame that Scott didn't get to use a double one, but never mind. So, James here is getting his first first turn. Just a quick reminder of the rules there from Scott. You cannot play a stadium that's already in play. So the fact that Scott put a Skyfield in play, like I've said, it means that every single Skyfield in James's deck is now a useless card. And you can bet it will be the final prize that Scott takes. Now we've got a good setup here from James. He got the Spirit Link so he can evolve Mega Evolve without ending his turn. And he got the Mega Rayquaza to get the evolution up. Remember the Delta Evolution Ancient Trait allows him to evolve turn one. The Spirit Link means he doesn't have to end his turn to do so. He got the double colorless and he got a water energy in the discard using his Ultra Ball there. So if he can draw into a Mega Turbo, he is going to be able to attach that water from the discard to his Rayquaza and actually get a KO right here, right now. Although he will have to take the six damage counters from that Bursting Balloon. Good news is he used that Ultra Ball to go and get himself a Hooper, which is not terribly surprising, to be perfectly honest. Most people in EX Heavy decks are going for the Hooper. So he goes there, and it looks like he's got himself at least one shame in. Now, he's already got a spare Rayquaza on the bench, although he might wish to go for a, a third one there. Allow him to retreat, save a bit of damage. If he's And he does there go for a third Rayquaza. There's the shame in. Had he had another Spirit Link, he actually could have gone and gotten another of the Megas, get two evolved up straight away. Unfortunately, not an option for him here, but he does hit the Mega Turbo. So a really, really good 
opening turn here from James. He gets a DCE, he gets the Mega Turbo, he gets the Spirit Link, and then straight away he's going to be able to use Emerald Break, doing 30 damage times the amount of bench Pokemon he's got, which at the moment will be 120 damage. So here he's got everything he needs to get the KO. The problem is that Bursting Balloon. Playing something like an escape rope would be awesome here, although we'd have to get his active out to get the Rayquaza back in. Or I don't believe he's played a supporter yet. I could be wrong about that, but I don't believe James has played a supporter. It is hard to keep up with everything when you're commentating these games on your own. It's nice to do it in a pair, but I don't have a partner right now, so there's nothing I can do. If he hasn't played a supporter and he has got a Lysander, he would be able to KO that Persimian on the bench and work around that bursting balloon do remember that bursting balloon only stays there for one turn at the end of your turn that bursting balloon gets well it just goes away now here's a downside of james's deck right now he's got a couple of shamans on his bench he's got a manaphy on his bench all of whom are quite low hp ex pokemon that are giving up two prizes when they are ko'd this means that Scott can ignore those Rayquaza in the active and just go ahead and try and KO those Pokemon on the bench. Manaphy's got 120 HP, Shaman's got 110, although resistance to fighting, which does make the mass more awkward. So here we go. There's a revive from Scott, gets that Persimian straight back from the discard onto the bench. This is going to be one of the big challenges really for <laughs> oh, and another bursting balloon and the double colorless so scott's got what he needs here you see he's also got a professor kakui in hand there which he could use to both do 20 extra damage and get himself an extra two cards and you see him discarding a pokemon catcher which is brilliant. I love the idea of that. Like I've said, and obviously he uses the Ultra Ball to get a third Persimian. One of the big keys for this Persimian deck is that you need to take efficient prizes. You don't want to be poking for 60, 70 damage. And there's a Versus Seeker for a Sycamore getting seven extra cards. Although it didn't look like there was a high five there. Poor form, boys. Now... You can't always get the big KOs with Persimmon. And in my video, one of the things I said was, are you going to be able to get enough damage, to do enough damage? But if you can use Pokemon Catcher to pick Pokemon off the bench, it's less of an issue. So we see there for Persimmon and the Mew as well. Don't forget the Memories of Dawn ability on the Mew that allows you to cop the, copy the attacks of the Persimmon. And there's a nest ball. Now, quick ruling query, and a lot of people are going to get annoyed and confused by this as we go. Nest ball puts the Pokemon straight onto your bench. That means that you can't, well, I suppose you could use it to grab something like a Shaman, but the Shaman would go straight to your bench and you wouldn't activate the ability. Now, the thing we've got to bear in mind, and it's taken me a long time to get to this, but it's been quite a fast-moving game, lots of interesting things to mention. That Rayquaza's got 220 HP and a resistance to fighting. So here, we're going to be doing 100 damage, less the 20 for resistance is 80. Add the 60 that was on before, should bring him up to 140. Now, there is 160 on him at the moment... I'm wondering whether that's been, whether I've, well, have I made a mistake or have they made a mistake? So, Persimian's team attack means that he gets to do 30 damage for every Persimian on the bench, plus 10. So that's 100. Take away the 24 Rayquaza's resistance, should be 80. Add the 60 for the Bursting Balloon, should be 140. And I don't think there's anything on the field that will take away the resistance. Unless I am wrong about that. No, I, th I think there might be a little bit too much damage on that Rayquaza. Because it should be 100. Minus 20 for resistance is 80. Plus the 60 he took from the Bursting Balloon should be 140. And there's currently 160 on there. Now the good news is it's not going to make a huge difference if... 
if James attacks into that Persimian, it's getting KO'd by the Bursting Balloon, regardless of whether it should be 160 or 180. I will have a look back at this after the game, and if it turns out I have made a silly mistake, I'll add a little appendix on the end. So if, the, if I am saying something wrong, pop it in the comments. But remember, ladies and gentlemen, check to the end of the video, check the appendix, because it may well be that if something has gone wrong, I've spotted it and added it on the end. So James here, his priority, he needs a second Rayquaza. Now there is the Lysander I was mentioning last turn. That's absolutely huge. It means he gets a KO and it means he doesn't get KO'd by the Bursting Balloon. Now, the thing is, what he hasn't done there is get rid of the double colorless energy. So Scott actually keeps the double colorless, which means he can now start building up energy on his Pokemon, and then he's not searching for that double colorless every turn. And that's one of the subtle things that Bursting Balloon does here. It means that either your opponent takes the damage, or you get to keep your energy, and that can be absolutely crucial. Now, there is a trainer's mail coming down there from Scott. I didn't exactly see what they were, but the one thing he's searching for here is something like maybe a super rod with a search card. Oh, there is a super rod right there. Maybe a revive. He needs to get that Persimian back. Now, not this turn. This turn with Mew, he's hitting 100 damage. With Persimian, he's hitting 50 damage, 70 minus a 24 resistance. So, with the 180 that's 160 that's currently on there, he should be all right. No, he won't get the KO, so he won't get the KO with a Persimian. He needs one more Persimian, otherwise he's only doing 50 and it will only put the Rayquaza up to 210, which is a slight problem. Now, there comes the Ultra Ball, so that Persimian should be coming straight back out again. Oh, no, it's an Orangaroo, sorry. So he's gone for the Orangaroo because he didn't go for the Super Rod. So he's actually gone for the Orangaroo here. It looks like Scott's going to try and get a double colorless and attack with the Mew rather than go the Persimian route unless he's got a way to recover the Persimian anyway and just make me look a little bit silly. Now, he has got a Bursting Balloon there, and the question is, does he put it on the Persimian with the Energy, or does he put it on the Active? Though he has gone for the Active here, it's not going to make a huge difference either way, but if he puts it on the Bench Persimian and then gets a Double Colorless, that would mean that if James had a Lysander, he'd have to not get the one with the Energy, or he'd take the extra damage anyway. Now, he's got the Double Colorless, which must have been what he was searching for there. So, a good play that paid off quite nice. He's now hitting for 70 which means he will be getting the KO on the Rayquaza, and that will be a KO. Although, if he'd have been at 140, that wouldn't have been a KO. So actually, if the damage was miscalculated, that's a, that's a fairly big thing. Never mind. Like I said, we'll have a quick chat at the end when we fill it all in. For the time being, that's what's happened, whether it's wrong or not. Now, here comes the Rayquaza. But again, there is that bursting balloon. Oh, no, sorry. I'm being a complete idiot. It was a Persimian that would have been hitting not enough. The Mew wasn't hitting 17. The Mew was hitting 100. It got the KO anyway. This is why it's so confusing. So the Mew hit for 100. 30, 30, 30 with the three Persimians plus the 10 was 100. So if there was a miscalculation, it made no difference at all. And that is my final word on the subject. I'm done, ladies and gentlemen. I'm done. Now, the challenge for James here is that he needs to get a new Rayquaza set up. Now, he's got an energy on there. He's going to need a double colorless. He's going to need a mega Rayquaza. He's going to need a spirit link. But this is what a deck like Persimian does to you. It's a war of attrition. Persimian is a basic that needs one energy attachment. That's it. That's all it needs. And you need to obviously be able to recover the Persimian. That's a, a slight pain, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas Mega Rayquaza needs the basic, the Spirit Link, the Mega, and the two energy attachments, one of which may well have to come from Mega Turbo. It's just much more investment. Now Mega Rayquaza gets the easy KOs, whereas Persimian is struggling to get the two-hit KOs. And that's really the game within the game here. 
can Persimian just keep chipping away, or can Rayquaza take out the Persimian so fast and so efficiently that Persimian just doesn't get those two hit KOs? And that's what this matchup really comes down to here. If James doesn't get a KO here, he's going to start falling behind in the prize race. If he does get a KO, he's doing all right. If he can take two KOs before his Rayquazas go down, he's looking in a very good position to win this game. But, oh, and there we go. No, he didn't get the KO. He didn't have the double colorless, which means that Scott is in a position to maybe jump ahead in this game. Now, you do see he's got an escape rope in the prizes. That might be big later on. But then again, I don't know if he's going to be able to threaten a one-hit KO on anything. But it is an interesting thing to consider. Certainly, it would be easier to get a two-hit KO on a benched Rayquaza, for instance. Maybe using Escape Rope one turn, Lysander the next. Now, there was the revive Scott got there. So, all four of his Persimians are out. And this is the ideal situation for Scott. Because now he's hitting 130. Hitting 80 with Persimian because of the resistance... That is not sustainable in the long run. That is not something, you know, that's a free hit KO on Rayquaza. And this is what I was talking about. This is where it becomes big. Now, the fact that he's hitting 130, he could get the KO on Mew. He could get the KO on Manaphy. Instead, he's getting the KO on Hooper because of the weakness. But this is how Scott wins this game. He survives in the early game. He gets the Persimian out. He makes sure he doesn't run out of resources. And then when he can take just a cheeky KO or two off the bench, that's how he wins. And if you look at James's deck, what do we see? We see Shaman, 110 HP. And the, and the resistance of fighting means nothing when there's a Mew there hitting for 130. We've got Shaman. Oh, sorry, we got the Manaphy with 120, which again is under the 130 threshold for which Mew's hitting. And then we've got the 180 HP Hooper with the weakness to Mew. So Mew, with the four Persimian on the bench, Mew hitting for 130, all of those support Pokemon are being KO'd, and it doesn't really matter. Scott can now take a nice easy two-hit KO and win the game. Now, that doesn't mean that James is out of it. It just means that James has a super awkward route to victory. Now, what he has done here is end Scott to two. That is a very useful thing to do. But you'll notice that Orangaroo on the bench, his ability allows Scott to draw until he's got three cards in his hand. So Scott is never going to have fewer than three cards for a turn. And at this stage, if Scott basically ever draws a Lysander, he's going to win the game because he can take a two-hit KO. What James needs to do, and I don't know if there's enough resources in his deck to actually do it, what he needs to do here is take a KO and then retreat and put a new Rayquaza up. And take a KO and then retreat and put a new Rayquaza up. Never let Scott hit the same Rayquaza twice. Now the problem with that strategy is that as soon as Scott hits a Lysander, he wins. That Mew going down doesn't really slow Scott down. Because he's got another Mew. No, sorry. I take it back. He's got two more Mews on the bench. So all he's going to need is a double colourless. And he'll just be able to swing again. Now, if James can force Scott into attacking with the Persimian here. Then Scott's only hitting 400 without the weakness. But the only way to do that is to KO the Mews. And the Mews have the fighting, uh, excuse me, the bursting balloon. So James in a horrible position here. Either he hits into the bursting balloon, or he takes out a Persimian on the bench, but then the Mew's still there with the energy. That There's very few good things to do, and there's the double colourless. Now, if Scott's got a Lysander, he wins, he doesn't. He plays Professor Sycamore, and at this stage, it's just kind of thinning out your deck. Now... Scott can't win the game here because Rayquaza's got 160 and Mew with a full quantity of Persimian plus Professor Kukui only hits 150 total. But again here, even a Persimian hitting for very little is going to be able to KO that Rayquaza when Lysander off the bench. So this is what it comes down to for James. He can take a hit from this Mew, but he's got to retreat the Rayquaza. 
He's got to have a new one to attack with, which I don't think he has. He hasn't even got any energy on the bench. And then he's got to hope Scott never hits a a Lysander. Because a single Lysander from Scott is going to win the game. And that Arangaru there is proving so, so useful. Because an end to one or an end to two is not going to do very... It won't be an end to one. But an end to two is so much less effective when Scott can have two cards... Draw one for his turn, he's got three. Play one or two of them, and then draw until he's got three cards in hand. It means an end to two may well allow Scott to see five or six cards before he has to attack. And that is not what you want from someone who wins the moment they draw a Lysander. And that Rayquaza there, having so little HP left, means that Scott's already got an attacker. Ivory's got the Mew with a double colourless in the active, or the Pissimian with a double colourless on the bench. Either will KO that Rayquaza. So it doesn't really matter what James does at this stage. If Scott has a Lysander next turn, he will win the game. And that Orangaru makes it so much more likely. If Scott doesn't have a Lysander, it's still going to take James three KOs to win. And he, I don't know if he can. Because sooner or later, he's going to be attacking with something that isn't completely fresh. Which means Scott can take a KO. Now, if James were playing something like Enhanced Hammer, just a, an item card that allows you to discard a special energy from anywhere on the field, he could maybe get the double colourless off the bench per Simeon, KO the active Mew, and maybe there's a way back there but it's super awkward to do so there is the retreat like i said he had to retreat in order to get the rayquaza up but i don't really know what is being achieved there did he forget to pay the retreat cost i think he might have retreated without paying the retreat cost there right mega rayquaza does have a retreat cost of one. Oh no i'm being an idiot that's why he plays manaphy ex don't forget manaphy ex's ability it's the card which is almost completely blocked by glare between the two shamans on james's bench making it easy to miss gives free retreat to any pokemon with water energy attached but there's the versus seeker there's the lysander on the hooper although to be honest it could have been the hooper or the shaman or the other shaman or the other shaman or the manaphy or the rayquaza the mega rayquaza or the damage didn't really matter scott had options congratulations to scott for winning this game showing us the power of persimian now certainly he got helped out in that matchup due to the fact that skyfield was going to be in play the whole game that really helped him and the fact that James was never given an opportunity to get rid of his weak Pokemon on the bench. But then again, when the weak Pokemon are Shaman and Manaphy and Hooper, you've got to wonder how he was ever going to get rid of all of those bench Pokemon. I don't know if James ever was going to. But congratulations to Scott. And thank you to Scott. He was one of the main characters involved in recording this and sending it off to me so I could commentate. And thank you to everyone at Athena Games in Norwich, James and Scott as well, for agreeing to be on the stream. Lovely people, all of them. And thank you to you guys. The views and likes and comments were very healthy on my previous gameplay video. So, yeah. As I've always said, if the views are good enough and you guys show me you want to see these videos, I will keep making them. So, yeah, you'll have another one of these coming in a couple days' time. Thank you very much to Scott and everyone at Athena Games. And don't forget, you can comment, be nice, like this video, subscribe to this channel, follow me on Twitter, at the Wossy, and the most important thing as always, look after yourselves until next time. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Ross, and you've been watching PTCG Radio.